Hi, welcome to the NASCAR NBC podcast. I'm your host, Nate Ryan, talking here on the day after the round of a cutoff race at Martinsville Speedway, where Ryan Blaney won to advance to the championship race at Phoenix. Also, William Byron qualifies for the championship round. They will join Christopher Bell and Kyle Larson in the championship race this Sunday at Phoenix Raceway on NBC. And here to join me to talk about it is our NASCAR Hall of Famer analyst, Dale Jarrett. DJ, start with the obvious. Ryan Blaney didn't need to win this race. He had performed really well in this round so far, finished sixth at Vegas, second at Homestead. So he came in 10 points above the cut line, but he seized the moment. I mean, he left this as a no doubter uh, and led the second most laps in the race, 145 laps led, uh, and really kind of dominated uh, the second half after he and Denny Hamlin had, had kind of battled the, the first uh, stage, a uh, couple of stages. So what did you see here from Ryan Blaney and what impressed you about his performance at Martinsville? Hey, I think the biggest thing as I was sitting watching the race was this was exactly what we had projected and thought that we were going to see from Ryan Blaney as he entered into the Xfinity series a number of years ago that with the talent that we saw there, the abilities that he has shown um, as he got into Cup and, and got that first win with the Wood Brothers, you know, these were the things that that we had in place and in mind for Ryan Blaney to do. You know, probably unrealistically, we expected him to do it every year, uh, but he has matured into that driver that that we thought uh, was there all along. And this round of eight was was so impressive. I mean, he was the driver that was in all the races um, that that you kept seeing his name pop up. And uh, especially the last two, uh, you know, he knew what he had to do uh, uh, as he didn't have a, a ton of points built up uh, from the regular season uh, that, you know, it, it was probably going to take a, a win in rounds uh, as we got closer to to cutoffs and uh uh, the, the run yesterday was just so impressive. Uh, you know, the car had the, the I will say it was enough speed at the beginning of a run. Uh, made for some great racing between he and Denny Hamlin in particular. Um, but he, he was able to outshine everyone uh, once they got uh, 25, 30 laps on tires. And then the longer the, the run went, you know, it's not his not that his car got faster. It just didn't fall off as as many others experienced. And and uh, he just did a phenomenal job. That last green flag run, something we haven't seen at Martinsville in a long time to to finish off a race. But it was just what uh, was ordered up uh, for Blaney and his team uh, to be able to do uh, kind of spoiled Eric Almarola's. Uh, opportunity there who you know obviously not a part of the playoffs but um, that that was just so impressive and you know, I, I know that as we get into this and we'll talk more uh, about the championship four here but you know you, you can't immediately go off and say okay we're gonna make Blaney the favorite uh, because of you know what Larson um, has done uh, he's the one that has won but I'm telling you what, if I'm looking at it and I look at the history uh, over in this particular car um, over the last two years, uh, Blaney's going to, if he's not somewhere tied with, with Larson as the favorite to, to win this on Sunday, uh, then he's really, really close. Well, Blaney finished second in that championship race last year to his teammate Joey Logano, who won the championship 2022 at Phoenix uh, and the race. And it seems as if this is one of his best tracks, Phoenix Raceway, DJ, for Ryan Blaney. And uh, I was struck by crew chief Jonathan Hassler told Marty Snyder in the post-race show that there's no other driver he would rather go to Phoenix with right now than Ryan Blaney. And of course, he's biased, but he also sounded authentic. He sounded genuine. I, I it, He sounded like he really believed that Blaney should be looked at as the, you know a guy to really watch a Phoenix. He's never won there. Um, but he's got six top fives there. So I, I think you're right. I think you can't put him in that conversation. And especially after this run at Martinsville, going back to, to Sunday, let's talk briefly again um, about his drive. Because as you said, he had this unusual 168 lap green flag run to end the race. Uh, don't often see that at Martinsville. That was after everybody made their final pit stops. So for a lot of that run, Ryan Blaney was in traffic and picking his way through um, as he made his way to the front and eventually passed Eric Almarola with, with 23 laps remaining. So what did you see there about how Ryan Blaney managed that race? 
you know, I, I, as I was watching it, um, I thought that, you know, this was going to be a, a, a tall order for him to um, make up the time because he was at one point, I think, like six and a half seconds behind Eric Almirola. And it looked like it kind of was stabilized there until Almirola got in some really heavy traffic. Um, I think it was Reddick and maybe Harrison Burton, who were still on the lead lap at the time, racing really hard to try to stay on that. But you, know, Almirola had more laps on his tires, um, and I know was having to save some fuel at uh, during certain parts of the run. But as it got to that point, you, you started seeing um, not just a tenth of a second a lap, but but bigger gains that that Ryan Blaney was making. And then I heard him after the race. Um, as I went off somewhere, I was listening to Sirius XM and I heard an interview that he did there talking about his car that he saw Saturday in practice, that it seemed like he had really good long run speed. Um, and so they, they wanted to have enough short run speed to, to do what they wanted to do. But he said, actually starting back where he did, uh, after they had pitted, he realized that he just needed to be patient. And if he could save some of his tires and, and not, you know, make everything, uh, you know, burn them off, uh, just trying to get himself back closer to the front, uh, that he would have better tires as the leader encountered traffic later in the, the race, if they did have a long run, that they would be in, in a more difficult position with the older tires and, and he could have better tires. And it's exactly what played out for him. So, you know, this is uh, a, another sign of that maturity that it takes to, to realize what you have versus your competition and what you're going to be able to utilize uh, in the race if it plays out the way. Obviously, a caution would have changed everything and, and he would have had to, to think differently. But um, it was just a phenomenal job of, of using what you have and, and thinking your way as to how you could get to the front. I think it helped him a lot, too, to know that they had scored all of those stage points uh, in the first two stages and that regardless of what happened, if he wasn't able to get back to the front, he knew that he had enough points built up that um, if he ran in the top three or four, then he was going to get through on points. But uh, I, I just like what I saw and being able to totally manage the race and, and not overdrive the car, which is something that you find yourself doing with a, with maybe the best car in the field, but you're mired back in traffic wanting to get back to the front. Yeah, it does take, a lot of patience, obviously, to drive at Martinsville. No one knows that better than you uh, or any veteran of the Cup Series. And Brian Blaney and his crew chief, Jonathan Hassler, made reference to the fact that Blaney has made a lot of changes in the offseason, uh, on the mental side particularly, for avoiding these mistakes uh, that had cost him in the past. You know, we, we talked about it, I think, the last time you were on the podcast about uh, the mistakes that Ryan Blaney made in the round of eight last year, you know, speeding, crashing and that cost him from getting to Phoenix. So he comes into 2023 DJ with a, a new approach. Um, he's, it sounds as if he's probably working with um, a coach who's, who's kind of helping him with that, with the off the track stuff. How do those improvements do you think manifest itself, particularly at a track like Martinsville? I think the biggest thing um, that even leading up to Martinsville, that, that, we saw him get himself in position uh, and not make those mistakes to take himself out. And, and I'll use this as the perfect example of, as to what happened with he and Larson um, the, the previous race to where, you know, Larson was, was gaining on him uh, as they entered pit road, made a big run at him, but Blaney being really smart, he, he knew, you know, Larson had nothing to lose because he already had his win. Uh, but um, at, at Homestead, um, Blaney knew that he had a car that, that could get him where he wanted to go. Uh, so he was not going to speed on that green flag stop. So even going back to there, I saw someone different uh, where before he would be pushing, 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 and then sometimes just get over that edge and take themselves right out of everything. Now, that came close to doing that uh, because of Larson's uh, move that he made. But I, I like the way that he was thinking there. And so I'll just ask you, uh, so is is this kind of the Kyle Petty effect that we're seeing on right now with, with the, you know, I, I won't call it criticism, um, but, but it kind of, I think it was constructive criticism because I know Kyle likes Ryan Blaney a lot. And, but, you know, with all the talk, we kept talking and talking about, Hey, if he can ever make it, if he can, you know, take away these mistakes. So now he's put himself in a position. I appreciate and applaud him for saying, Hey, 
and you know, let's figure this out. Uh, if it takes going and talking to someone else, there is nothing wrong with that. You know, over the years, we've all talked to, to people about, you know, how to handle certain situations and get us through that. And when you have that at your disposal, uh, why not use that? And, and obviously, Ryan has has talked to someone. I don't know who it is and don't care who it is, but heck, maybe it is Kyle Petty. Who knows? But um, uh, he he is doing what he needs to do. And that was very obvious in this round of eight that, you know, in particular in this round, that he knew what it was going to take to get through. And he knew that any mistakes uh, could be uh, very costly to them getting to this point. So now he's gotten to this point. Um, and he doesn't have to worry about points. He doesn't have to worry about a stage or anything like that. So now he can just go back. He still has to think about the consequences uh, this coming Sunday of making a mistake because we've seen teams and drivers take themselves right out of an opportunity to win at Phoenix uh, in, in the years that we've had the championship race here and uh, you know take themselves right out of it. But I think that this kind of seems that Blaney might have a, a leg up on, on a lot of people on the side of thinking his way through this. Yeah, tune in for Sunday's pre-race show where DJ asked Kyle Petty if he's secretly been giving Ryan <laughs> Blaney advice. Oh, you uh, but I think it's going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think you said it correctly is that Kyle is a big believer in Ryan Blaney, and he yeah. was on the podcast right after Blaney's victory at Talladega. And Kyle's point was, if this version of Ryan Blaney the one who is that thinking man's racer, made all the right chess moves at Talladega to win that race. If that version of Ryan Blaney shows up for the round of eight, Kyle said, Ryan Blaney is going to make the championship four and maybe be the guy to win it. And I think it was somewhat prescient what, what KP yeah. said because that Ryan Blaney did show up in the round of eight. Like I said, sixth, second, first were his finishes here. Um, and I think KP's frustration was he knows that Ryan Blaney can be that championship contender. But as you said, DJ, everybody, there's a point at which I think everybody gets tired of talking about it when you, you want to see it. Yes. And now we're seeing it. Um, and that, you know, Ryan Blaney's always had that low key laid back demeanor. Um, but it's weird. He seems to let emotions kind of get the best of him and, and pressure him into m these mistakes and lapses. And it seems as if this, this is, he's managed it really well. And then you combine that with the speed in his cars. Uh, I think that's been the, the bigger surprise here. I, I, I'm not as surprised that Ryan Blaney kind of like figured out how to be a better mental presence, especially like you said, he's getting that help, but that the Penske Fords had much of the year, uh, especially on mile and a half tracks, like the, the last two races at, at Vegas and, and Homestead this round, is that, is that the combination they kind of found? And, and what do you think the team has done that number 12 Ford team to, to give Ryan contending cars to match up with his newfound kind of confidence composure behind the wheel. Yeah, you're exactly right, Nate, that, that it was that combination. Um, you know, you, first and foremost, they needed to find speed in their race cars. I, I don't care how good you are. It, you, you know, you, you can make up some as a driver at certain racetracks, um, but you, you can't, you can't put yourself in a position enough times if you don't have that raw speed. They knew what they they needed to do. And Ryan Blaney alluded to this again in that XM radio uh, interview that I heard that he said, you know, I just had to I kept telling my guys that we just need speed. And, and they didn't question him. He said they believe that. And they just kept saying we're working. This isn't something we know we need speed, but it, you know, easy to say, very hard to do. And so but they. They kept finding things, little things along the way. And, and finally, here in the playoffs, uh, we have seen that speed that the Fords in particular have been lacking. I mean, if we go back to the first third of the year, I, I would have almost guaranteed you that, you know, unless somehow the great Joey Logano found another way to find himself in the championship four uh, with, without having the best and fastest car, um, then there wasn't probably going to be a Ford in the championship four. And it, but it was Blaney and his team that realized what they needed to work on and give their driver. And then he took the speed that they found and, and paired that uh, with his new mental approach to this. And, and it's done just a phenomenal job. This is good to see. You know, this is, um, you know, we talk all the time about 
you know, what's the face of the sport going to be as now Kevin Harvick is leaving there? You know, we've seen uh, a number of these uh, veteran drivers. Uh, it comes their time uh, to, to, move, to move on. And, and Kevin Harvick, it's not like Ryan Blaney is going to replace Kevin Harvick. But for the time being, uh, you know, this is a driver in the Ford camp that, that Ford can feel good uh, about having there and, and has, having that uh, ability to put themselves right there in championship moments. So, uh, you know, the, this was uh, an all-around team effort, if you will. His pit crew has done a nice job. Uh, they've given him speed with this race car. And uh, I'm telling you, he's going to battle whoever it is. If, if it's all four of them, the other three and Blaney, uh, that, that are racing for those top four spots, which we've seen uh, through, throughout the years in the championship race. But he's going to be right there. And, and uh, you know, this is fun to see. You know, I love his attitude. Um, I think the fans uh, really embrace Ryan Blaney. And, you know, as much as I like this for Ryan Blaney, I love this for his dad and for his family because, you know, I go back to the days of, of racing with Dave and, you know, his family has always been in racing and uh, just a, a great group of people. And, and now to see Ryan uh, be right there and, and have this shot at a championship is nice. Yeah, Ryan Blaney actually grew up in High Point because at the time Dave Blaney was racing for Bill Davis Racing, which was based near there. So essentially Martinsville, and Ryan said this to Barney Snyder in his post-race interview, Martinsville is his home track and was it's he he was closer to Martinsville than he was to Charlotte growing up in High Point, North Carolina. So this is where Ryan Blaney really wanted to win. And I think you make a nice point, DJ, about how with Kevin Harvick exiting we're seeing the changing of the guard in this championship four. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but this is the youngest championship four field ever. Uh, and the other driver who made it yesterday at Martinsville was William Byron, another driver in his twenties, like Ryan Blaney, like Christopher Bell. And it was a little bit different for William Byron though, in terms of Ryan Blaney dominates, wins the race, leaves no doubt. William Byron scores no stage points with a very average car, finishes 13th in what he says is his worst race of the year. And really has to gut this one out, which surprised me, DJ, because he won at Martinsville last year. And I thought, you know, at 30 point lead, he could just roll in, be fine, just qualify well, get some stage points. I thought he'd have this locked up at halfway after stage two. I wasn't really buying his pessimism because after Homestead, William Byron kind of struck this chord of like, ah, I don't know about that 30 point lead. Obviously, he knew that short tracks were not the team's forte <laughs> that they were last year and that. They were going to struggle, got kind of compounded by the fact that his uh, helmet blower wasn't blowing air in. So he's ex under extremely tough conditions. It was a very, very hot day, unseasonably warm day in Martinsville. Um, talk about this performance by William Byron, because it really was, I mean, again, 13th place finish, nothing to write home about, but he really had to tough it out to get it. Yeah, well, it, it, it wasn't anything to write home about. Um, I mean, he got lapped on the racetrack in that long run. That, that, that certainly wasn't what they needed to find themselves in that position uh, because you know, it, it would have gotten even more interesting if a late race caution had to happen and he wasn't the free pass. You know, the, the guys uh, on NBC uh, telecast were going through all of those scenarios that, you know, he as, as hard as it was, and you could see after the race when he was sitting down uh, on the asphalt uh, beside his car that, you know, just how difficult a day this was. I didn't know at that exact time that, and maybe I'd heard it earlier, but I'd forgot that, that his helmet blower wasn't working, but I knew that he had complained about the heat inside the car. And uh, that, that is a tough place anyway. I can think of back to, to my days of, of driving there on some hot days that, that just physically exhausting uh, to you. And uh, it's a long 500 lap race. And when it's not performing, makes it even harder. He may have done an even better job of driving than Ryan Blaney did to win the race. If you look at it in the way of, of taking an ill handling car, uh, things not working inside the car uh, to, to help him any at all. And uh, but he but he gutted it out. And, and that told me a lot about this young man and and uh, you know, what he can do. He's, he's had his best season. Um, you know, we can say that about, you know, at least three of the four. Uh, we can't say that Larson had his best season, but he had a great season once again. But the other three have, have had just phenomenal seasons for them in their young careers and and shows us that, you know, we, we've got a lot of racing with them coming on. But but I was impressed. It, yeah, 13th is not what you want to do. It wasn't what I expected. As you were pointing out, I expected them to, you know, get enough stage points and, and really not have to be concerned as to what the end of the race might look like. 
uh, going forward yesterday. But but they did what they had to do. And, and every race can't be – you can't script it. Yeah, you can put it up there how you want it, but uh, it can't always play out the way that you want it. So, so I admire this young man for toughing it out. You know, that, that's so hard inside the car when you're burning up and, and just waiting to get to the end. I'm sure, you know, they mentioned at one time when there were 30 laps to go, I said, you know, that seems like a short time, but when you're inside of there fighting this car – uh, and, you know, you're, you're trying to think about what you need to do and just get yourself to the end. Uh, that's a long 30 laps. But um, I'll assure you they'll be much better when it comes to uh, the championship race this weekend. I expect that. But this is, you know, I realize this isn't technically uh, considered a short track, but every driver will tell you that it drives like a short track and that's what you have to do. So, um, uh, but, you know, they, they have one here. Uh, they know how to get the job done and I expect them to be very competitive. Byron said there was no chance he was getting out of this car, uh, but the last 50 laps, he said he was really feeling it because as he described it, it was basically like having a hairdryer blowing hot air. <laughs> his head. Uh, and I, I, I can't relate to that. While you're trying to make these laps at this really rough and tumble short track, what, what would that have been like, do you think, if, if you had to do that? And, you know, what's the longest you've stayed in a car where you wanted to get out but knew you had to get to a finish? Can you Can you relate to what William went through? Yeah, I certainly can. And, and, you know, those helmet blowers, a, a lot of times, even on hot days, uh, you, you think that, wow, is this thing really working? Until you turn it, you can turn it off and then realize the difference. But whenever it's just blowing hot air, then, you know, that's just excruciating. And, um, you know, it, it makes a hard job uh, so much more difficult. And, and I tried to back in the early 90s, I was actually driving for the Wood Brothers and it was a July 4th race in Daytona. And, and the new thing was one of these uh, cool vests that you could wear. And it actually had a hat that you put on uh, and tubes in it that, that ran through and the water circulated through there. And, and the vest had tubes in it also. And about 30 laps into uh, you know, what was the Firecracker 400 at that time in the middle of the day on Saturday in Daytona, um, where it was, you know, even though we started uh, in the morning uh, around 11 o'clock, it was still extremely hot. Uh, but this thing quit operating. Uh, but the worst thing was, is it wouldn't turn off. And and um, it so it, it cir kept circulating uh, hot water through those. And so I, I actually received second degree burns uh, mm. on because I, it was took to get to a caution before I could jerk the wires out of the thing to make it stop pumping. But it it sat there still uh, on my body the, the the rest of the race. So, you know, I, I admire William for sticking it out yesterday, knowing, and it's hard. You can see that, that he was physically sick. And, and that's what happens when you get overheated. Uh, you have the carbon monoxide, uh, which is prevalent, especially on the short tracks where that air uh, is just there. It never goes away. And so uh, you just get a, a feeling like you, want to literally throw up and you could see that's kind of i think william after the race would be like hey if you'll turn these cameras off i'll turn over here to throw up and and uh maybe i'll feel better but uh uh you can see him really struggling to to get through that but you know that just shows that it goes to show you what athletes and and drivers in, in this sport uh will put themselves through to to make it happen and how much it means to you you know that was a a whole body of work through an entire year of his best year uh, that was facing him. He could not get out of the car and you have to really dig deep. And, and so uh, many of us have, have gone through situations like that. And if William Byron goes on to win this championship this weekend, you know, he'll always look back at that day at Martinsville and yes, you know, yeah, hey, it wasn't anything to brag about with a 13th place finish, but he knows what he had to do as a competitor uh, to make it through and just get to the end of that to, to where he could be a part of the championship four. Yeah. He showed a ton of fortitude and certainly very deserving of being in the championship four field. Let's talk about the four drivers who didn't advance DJ. We'll start with the pole sitter at Martinsville was Martin Truex Jr. Uh, ran well, the first couple of stages, most of the first uh, couple of stages, I should say midway through stage two, he has a speeding penalty. And that pretty much kills this day because track position was so crucial as it's been with the next gen on, on short tracks. Mm -hmm. So uh, Zach Tanzaretti uh, got some quotes from Truex about that speeding penalty. I just want to read this to you. Truex said that that was the first time we've ever had that first pit stall at Martinsville. They told me to look for four red lights on the dashboard and I'd be safe leaving the box uh, because you know pit road speed is time over distance. If you're in that first box, and technically, you should be able to just stomp on it after you have a pit stop and, and be safe. 
Uh, but Truex said that he went to two red lights and got caught speeding. So it was, as Truex said, it was a little confusing there. I felt like I went by that info. We were way over. We've got to look at that. If we ever get that pit stall again, we will know better. It was definitely surprising. And then Truex said, that one is on me. I find Jay, because is it on him? Because I feel like this is somewhat of a reprise of what we've been talking about, what you have said about this team, what others have said that it just, it feels like another example of the 19 team just not being buttoned up well enough to keep the driver in the race. Yes, Truex commits the speeding penalty, but if he's not given the right information, to me, that's as much on the team, which is, again, what we've been talking about ad nauseum through the playoffs with Martin Truex Jr. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, that was just, as we watched that yesterday, and I'm not sure that he had the car to, to beat Ryan Blaney anyway, um, but they didn't, they'll, we'll never know that because they, once again, through the nine races, um, that, that was not what we expected to see uh, from this championship driver. And uh, you can, for the most part of it, I, I still go back and say that you can't put uh, much of this on Martin Truex Jr. just like yesterday as you're talking about the wrong information that he's given. You, you only go off of what they tell you. And, you know, I know that technology and new technology is a wonderful thing until it's not. And then uh, you find yourself in trouble. And, you know, they couldn't recover from that. But, you know, it was just another of, of the races that in this, this championship round that he just, th- th- this team just didn't perform. And, you know, I don't know if it's the leadership. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great things about James Small that, that you know, make us appreciate who he is and what he does and, and give them good cars. And, they, you know, they won the regular season championship. So he obviously knows what to do. But, you know, but this was from a performance level, from a, a high-level race team, uh, this was as bad as we've seen uh, in the playoffs, in my opinion, from someone that went in, probably went in as the favorite uh, with the way that they were performing. And uh, to say underperformed, uh, that, that would be, uh, you know, an understatement. Uh, at, the, at this particular time, you hate to see it, but but yesterday they just could. You know, it was great that they went there. They won the poll. It, you know, it gave you hope that okay, can they have one race out of nine uh, that they can get through here? And and that's all that it took because of their you know regular season. Of, I won't call it dominance, but but great performance that they had to build up the the playoff points that kept getting them through each round. And here they were in the last race. Um, knowing that basically they, they needed a win to get it done. They go win the poll, they have a fast car, and, uh, you know, they find a way to, to mess that up. So I hate it for Martin, um, you know, after especially after announcing he was coming back from for another year. Uh, he might be rethinking that after these nine races. But uh, uh, we'll look forward to him to have the offseason, go do some fishing, hunt, and everything that he loves to do away from the track, and, and he'll be reset and ready. Uh, whenever the clash starts uh, in early February. But, you know, it was just hard to watch this. But uh, I think they have some real searching and soul searching to do to decide, you know, what they're going to do to be better um, at, when next year comes around. Um, but I'm sure you're right. He and James Small on the team will put in the work in the offseason, returned, renewed, and refreshed, as will Martin Truex Jr.'s Joe Gibbs Racing teammate, Denny Hamlin, who comes up eight points short of advancing to the championship four after a third place finish. Uh, DJ, I thought Denny did a really gracious interview with Parker Kligerman, and it almost sounded like Denny has already kind of made peace with the fact that he's the winningest driver in cup history without a championship. He's a surefire Hall of Famer, uh, but it almost seems like he's kind of reached the point where if it doesn't happen for him, he's going to be okay in some ways with not getting that title. And, you know, maybe it's that, on the side now, he's got this burgeoning 2311 race team with two drivers who could win championships. You know, Tyler Reddick just made it to the round of eight yesterday and didn't quite get there. Bubba Wallace certainly showed speed throughout the playoffs. Um, what, what's your take on where Denny kind of is uh, in terms of his career and where things stand for him? Yeah, and, and this, you know, this we can't just say yesterday that they didn't get it done. They, they brought a fast race car. They put themselves in position. Uh, once again, um, you know, they just there simply was one car better. You know, I know uh, Denny finished third, but but Blaney was the only better car there yesterday that, than Denny Hamlin was. So they did everything uh, that they kind of needed to do. You know, their, their whole um, round of eight went awry, uh, you know, last week at Homestead with uh, what they said was a power steering issue. And, 
And, um, you know, that was just very unfortunate because he had himself in a position there to, to win or, or if not win, he was going to run in the top three and, and gather the points that, that he needed to to be in a much better position. And if that doesn't happen, then then we're talking about something totally different. You know, it's not William Byron that's getting thrown points. It would have been Denny Hamlin. So, um, but these are things that do happen. I hate it for Denny because and I, I know, you know, how much – it would mean to Denny, and we've talked for a lot of years uh, about, you know, the, the seasons that he's had, put himself in position, and he just constantly does this, puts himself right in position. I, I did really feel like that he came into the playoffs this year with the most speed and the, the most momentum. And, you know, that first round he started out uh, just incredibly fast and um, just ne- never quite – carried that on through the, the next couple of rounds, but it was good enough. And it looked like this round of eight that they kind of found things once again. So I, I, I still hope there's still hope in me that, that Denny Hamlin wins a championship. Uh, I appreciate the driver that he is, um, the person that he is uh, willing to speak his mind and uh, you know, his, his record, his wins, um, you know, the, the big wins that he has, you know, those all are, are hall of fame credentials that, um, uh, are just so impressive. And, and now he has this, you know, he's, he had the idea to build this race team with Michael Jordan. Uh, they put it together. You, you see great things happening with that. And, and I know that he talks that, you know, he, he might have to live through that and this, this championship that he wants uh, so desperately might come through that uh, in time. But I, I know that he's not going to give up on this. I knew yesterday uh, had to be very disappointing day at the end of it for him. And uh, it's hard to put your thoughts all together there. But I know deep inside that there's you know, Denny Hamlin. Don't don't read into that, that that he's not thinking that he can't go yeah. back next year. But as you get older, you realize that your opportunities uh, are slipping by. And so uh, you know, I'm sure that we'll see him battling for that once again. But uh, again, he had a great race and uh, just appreciate who he is. And, you know, you, you don't want – He's going to leave a mark on the sport in a lot of ways, um, and, and they're all very, very positive ways. Um, you, you just don't want that moniker that, you know, he's the winningest driver to, to not win a championship. And, uh, you know, but Mark Martin went through that, and, and I don't think any of us that raced with and against Mark Martin and, and know who he is, and much like Denny, um, you, you, you don't hold that against them, that, that they never were able to, to get that title, uh, especially Denny, to this point. You know, when I think about Mark Martin, I still think of one of the greatest race drivers uh, in the history of NASCAR that, that I had the opportunity to, to watch and then to eventually race with and against uh, through a lot of years. So, um, you yeah, know, this, again, unfortunate for Denny, but, uh, you know, he, he has built his legacy uh, uh, in this sport. Well, you, I think, have unique insight on this, DJ. The, on the, you have unique insight in that age comes with perspective. Mm-hmm. And next month, Denny Hamlin turns 43. You were a few weeks shy of 43 when you won your championship in 1999. And that came on the heels of two dominant seasons by Jeff Gordon, where he won the championship, where your team was right there and maybe would win the title in any other year. Uh yep going back to like where you were 25 years ago and where Denny Hamlin is now going into the off season, looking ahead to 2024, can you kind of think about like how, how he might kind of reset his mind, how he might look at, you know, things now at his age and where he is in life, his career and where you were then and maybe how it all relates. Yeah, I, I think I can relate. And, and as I was watching yesterday, I was thinking about those very things that uh, I, I realized that, you know, not as many drivers are, you know, driving into their, you know, getting close to mid 40s uh, and having as much success. We, it's such a uh, great group of, of talent, uh, you know, in their, their younger years. And I think that, um, you know, that's having a lot to do with it because we have so many more com- that are competitive uh, in, in that situation. So for Denny, it's making it more difficult to, to achieve that. But you're, you're right. Um, you know, I wasn't sure that I was going to get there. We came close through, you know, especially 96, 97 and 98. I mean, we had outstanding years and and, uh, you know, you know, I thought, wow, we we're just doing everything that we can do. I, I'm 97, I won the most races that I won in any year of my career, winning seven races, one of them being right here in Phoenix. And, um, you know, it was just incredible to think that, gosh, we do this and we we can't win because of this 
a guy named Jeff Gordon. That's obviously one of the, the greatest drivers to ever come along. And, um, yeah, but, but I think that at the end of 98, I had some health issues during that. And so I got through that. And once I got through that, um, I was like, okay, we can still go do this. You know, we, we have built the foundation here. And that's what Denny has done. He's built that foundation. He knows what he has to do and, and get it done. He will be a part um, uh, of the, the championship and, and, and the playoffs next year. Um, and and it, it, it may pop up that, you know, maybe it's not the, the best uh, – regular season that that he'll have but i'll guarantee you that, that we'll see his name uh, through the first couple of rounds with an opportunity to go into the round of eight and and uh he is just so talented um that that he's going to be able to to do this again and again i know yesterday was a huge disappointment but that this off season gives you time to reflect and look ahead and, and get yourself prepared and ready once again because he's just such a a huge competitor i don't care if it's on the racetrack on the golf course uh, used to be on the basketball court a lot. I don't think he's doing as much of that anymore. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he is just so competitive. And, uh, you know, I just hope that he gets that opportunity again. Yeah. Uh, let's put a bow on Martinsville. The other two drivers who didn't make it, Tyler Reddick, Chris Pusher, who was your dark horse pick to make the championship for. Uh, and I'm not saying that to uh, oh, no. a little bit. I'm sure. I thought Busher could have made it based off his regular season, I mean, three wins. Uh, but it just didn't seem like in the playoffs, I think that uh, he he had an eighth place at Martinsville, and that was his best finish in round of eight, and maybe only top 10 of the playoffs. It seemed like it just wasn't quite right right his time yet for Chris Buescher. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a great season, uh, his best season in the Cup Series to this point. And, um, you know, I think that what we saw uh, and what emerged as a driver that we'll be keeping our eye on. Uh, you know, this team that that Brad Keselowski came in, bought into, uh, you know, vowed to, to turn this around and 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 bring uh, Ralph Fenway back to prominence and, and adding his uh, name to that. Um, you know, th they have done that. And um, the, the problem is, is that, um, you know, we talked about the speed that the 12 team and Ryan Blaney brought to the playoffs. Um, they Chris Buescher and his team were good. But good's not good enough uh, whenever you get into the round of eight. You, you've got to figure out a way to be great during that time. And I think this was probably uh, a learning situation for them. I'll have to say, though, that, that Brad and his six team uh, seemed to bring a lot of speed to the, the round of eight in particular, uh, even though he found himself in the wrong spot a couple of times, uh, just like yesterday. Um, they, they had a lot of speed where Busher found themselves. They were on an uphill climb. Each and every one of, of these races uh, just didn't seem that they could get their qualifying and show the speed there. So, you know, they were having to battle in different ways. But, um, you know, it, again, a great season. Um, you know, yeah, my pick was was way out there. But I, I thought that, you know, what I had seen that you know, this was a possibility um, uh, that, you know, he can I could either go in and steal a win or, um, you know, point his way through there. But but really proud. And, and it was fun to watch him in this season. Now, uh, as they reset, you know, can they come back out? You know, this was a monumental season for that team to turn around and bring the cars and, and the speed that they did uh, throughout the season. And uh, can that can they continue with this next year? Yeah, ultimately wasn't able to make it. Nor we had some uh, mechanical issues with his car and just never was really in it. Um but I'm sure we'll see both of them in the future, uh, but not in Phoenix this year. Let's look ahead now to Phoenix, DJ, and let's start Xfinity Series Championship race happens Saturday. You got Justin Allgaier, Cole Custer, John Hunter Nemechek, Sam Mayer, and you and I were talking before we got started. I, I think we're both surprised that Justin Allgaier is not a champion yet, but one of these drivers will become a first-time Xfinity Series champion, and this is the latest of many tries for Justin Allgaier, who... If you're talking about experience or veteran wise, he certainly would be the favorite. Yeah. You know, when you look at it, you know, we always said because he's Justin Allgaier has been so good at Phoenix through the years. And, and I think a lot of his success was on the older track uh, before the, the reconfiguration of it. Much like Kevin Harvick, uh, when you look back over the years, uh, but they still run well enough. And, and Allgaier has run well enough here to make you think that, you know, you're going to have to beat this guy. He has the most experience by far. Uh, but when you look at it, uh, you know, all of them other than Sam Mayer 
uh, made their way through the Xfinity series, found themselves in cup rides and, and um, maybe not uh, the, the greatest cup rides, even though Custer was at, at Stuart Haas racing and, and a good ride. And he, he won a race there, uh, but they all made their way there, but then came back down and, and uh, uh, have worked their way back through this and now a part uh, of, of the championship four here. And you know, th- this is going to be a great battle. Uh, you know, I, I think you, I think I have to, even with all guys' success here, John Hunter Nemechek has brought speed pretty much every weekend uh, of this season. And and I still think he's the, the driver that you're going to have to to beat. You know, it was um, a Joe Gibbs racing, uh, uh, Ty Gibbs that, that won here last year um, and, and got that championship. And I look at John Hunter coming in here at, at, along the same lines that as that, you know, he's won the most races, um, but, but he's, he's going to have a real battle on his hands of getting through that. And, uh, you know, this would be great for his hand. You know, his dad, Joe is a, a former champion of the Xfinity side. And, um, you know, it would just be great to, to see that happen, but you can make a case for each of these guys. Uh, Cole Custer has been, uh, just solid, uh, once he got back and got you know, himself acclimated to these cars once again, uh, they've been solid. And then Sam Mayer, the run that he's put on in, in winning four races, I think it's four out of the last 13 maybe that, that he's won coming in. So, you know, there's nobody hotter than what he is except for maybe John Hunter. And, uh, you know, this, this is going to be fun to watch. And uh, knowing that we're going to be on Saturday looking at someone gathering that first championship makes this really special. Yeah, and we could see it. Sunday as well, we've got three drivers in the championship four for the cup race Sunday in Bell, Blaney, Byron, all gunning for their first championship in the cup series. Larson going for his second. Youngest championship four field in history, DJ, by nearly four years. The average age is just over 29. Kyle Larson is the old man at 31 years old. <laughs> um, so it, it does seem sort of fitting, again, when we touched on earlier, that Harvick is exiting. You're kind of having that that Gen X uh, series of drivers make their departure. And now we're seeing that, hey, these millennial Gen Z drivers are going to be the ones we'll be talking about for the championship in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this is the, the best of the best right here. And, and you know, again, as you point out, when you when you look at the sport going forward, uh, you know, these are these are the names and faces that, that we're going to be looking at. And, you know, there's a number of others that that. You know, we talked about there with, you know, Tyler Reddick and Chris Buescher and, and uh, you know, and many other young drivers that are coming along and, and some that are going to be coming along uh, with a, a better opportunity. Uh, and then, you know, you talk about Bubba Wallace and many other uh, drivers that, that we feel like are going to be uh, solid in this. But this group that we have now, for this to be the youngest uh, group there and to think that the oldest one battling for a championship on Sunday is just 31 years old. Uh, the, the race wins that they have already produced uh, just phenomenal. And, um, you know, the abilities that they have shown, especially with this new car, uh, are, are just amazing and, and makes it fun to watch. And uh, knowing that that the sport's in good hands, if you will. So, um, you know, there, yeah, there's a three and four chance we'll have a new champion. Um, but the one guy they have to beat um, and I'm, I'm sure when the odds come out, I haven't didn't look this morning, but you know, it has to be Kyle Larson on top. That's who you're going to have to be. Uh, experience does matter. Um, you know, it's not the it's not the determining factor. Uh, but when you race someone that has been in this position, and not only have they been there, but but they took advantage of that opportunity to to go and grab that uh, uh, with. Uh, getting the championship back in, in 2021, then then you realize that, that Kyle Larson is the man to beat. But, um, you know, it, it's going to be a great battle. We, we've seen the the driver go on to – that has to win this race to become the champion. You've had to win every single year. And I I know that as I listened to some fans yesterday uh, on the radio after it was over expressing, you know, um, their opinions and things with it that – this might be the year that, that that ends. I think we say that every year uh, just because yeah. you've got so many more that have the possibility than the four that do have that possibility. But I honestly believe once again um, that, that as we go into this on Sunday, that, that you're going to have to win this race if you plan on being the champion. Yeah, I don't see that streak ending. I mean, as strong as Ryan Blaney is at Phoenix and knowing Larson won here to win the championship in 2021, like you said, it's it's happened all nine previous years. I don't see why it wouldn't happen no. this year. Um, we'll we'll get out on your pick, do, or do you have a pick? Any predictions for what happens Sunday? 
Yeah, you know, and, it, and it's easy to go off of uh, the most recent thing that happened, uh, but it's not just the most recent. It is, it's the, the recent history at Phoenix um, with Ryan Blaney and his team uh, with this car, and, and I think that that means a lot, that they have everything that it takes. Uh, they have the speed in the cars. Um, you know, he's performed well here. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, he finished second to, to his teammate Joey Logano, Logano here last year when uh, Logano was the champion. And uh, I just believe this is, is Ryan Blaney's time. Uh, I, I believe he comes in as the hottest driver um, uh, performing on this type of track. And, and I just uh, think that. Now, you know, I could sit here and make an easy case that when you talk about Larson has won here and he's won a championship here. Uh, Byron has won at this racetrack. Uh, recently. And uh, then you talk about Christopher Bell, a uh, young man that stepped up the last two years and, and made his way into the, the championship four by, by winning big races in critical moments. Um, you, you can make a case for each one of them. That's why I'm so excited to, to get to Sunday uh, and see exactly what happens. But my pick's going to be Ryan Blaney. All right. Well, there you have it. And we're excited to get to Phoenix where Dale Jarrett is based these days. And oh, by the way, uh, also a World Series in town uh, <laughs> this week. So I can't help but note, DJ, that since you threw out the first pitch, uh, this has been a charm team. <laughs> so yes. I think your special championship touch has worked out <laughs> well for them. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. I, it's been been fun to uh, have some conversations with people and, and uh, talking about that, uh, the, the level that they performed at uh, since I was fortunate to, to be there back in September and, and throw out the first pitch and take some batting practice, uh, which I shouldn't have been doing, but uh, did it and had fun anyway. But uh, they're on a great roll. And, and just to watch this team battle, you know, it, it embodies exactly what we talk about, about these championship four drivers. You know, they're uh, they're battling and, and having to get themselves in position and what they had to work to get there and then perform at that high level. And, and you know, whenever the Diamondbacks lost that first game in, in such a tough way uh, on Friday night after leading the majority of the game and then, uh, you know, get tied on a home run and then eventually losing it on a home run, I wondered how they would respond to that. But, but they came back on Saturday night and uh, outperformed. So uh, as the series moves right here to Phoenix tonight, uh, weather's going to be great. Um, and uh, look forward to knowing that they've got three games uh, here in Phoenix to, to get it done. And, you know, once we get past that, we'll, uh, we're going to be in championship mode, uh, whichever way, uh, thinking about and talking about everything that's going to happen out at the Phoenix Raceway. Uh, sold out once again uh, for the weekend. Uh, camping is going to be great. So should be a fun weekend. Low 80s for temperatures. So can't be any better. It's going to be a great week for sports in Phoenix. And we're looking forward to being out there. Just like we always look forward to having Dale Jarrett on the NASCAR and NBC podcast. DJ, as always, thanks for being here. Thanks, Nate. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports and NBC YouTube channel.